What's up guys and welcome back to this channel. In this video I'm going to be focusing more on the mid-sized businesses and I'm going to show you what actually happens behind the curtains once you go out there and you try to sell your solutions. So the first thing that you need before you even start building, in my opinion, is to already have some sort of a sales funnel. You need somehow have access to the people that you want to target your services to. That means, let's say you have some sort of a database containing all the email addresses of people who you think you can sell these stuff to, whether it's real estate agents, whether it is mid-sized businesses, marketing agencies, or more specifically, like decision makers in a marketing agency company. First of all, you need to see, do I have access to these? Would they listen to me as somebody who's maybe a little bit younger, somebody who's a little bit outside the field? Would they trust me? And if the, all these answers are no, then that's absolutely fine. I, this is where I also started. Most of the businesses that I tried to target wasn't even anywhere near my expertise. One of the businesses was in the wedding venue industry, which, okay, I've never thought I would sell anything to these guys, but I just identified like a problem that I think I can solve. And then I tried to focus my attention on that. It didn't work out well. I mentioned my experience in these other videos. So you can also get some of the knowledge and the experience of what I went through so you don't replicate it yourself. I'm not here to give any advice. I'm just here to maybe share with you the steps that I had to research a long time to try to find out. And hopefully this will save you time starting in your journey. So definitely, if you have some sort of uh, potential people, potential leads that you can send emails to, you can contact, you can hopefully maybe send some referrals to, this makes the process so much easier. And if you're saying, if you're like me, you don't know nobody. And I mean, I know some people, but I don't know like business people in specific industries. For example, one big thing that annoyed me that I don't know any real estate agents that I can just sit with them, have a cup of coffee and just say, hey, like, what are your problems? Let me try to solve it with AI. I tried to do some intros of to just to capture their attention, uh, but it was always a challenge. It, this is like one of the biggest things, especially if you're like a technical person who hasn't identified problems yet. You need to talk to other people who maybe have been in the industry for six years and they know exactly, oh my God, yeah, this one problem is such an annoying thing. And if by chance the technology now is there to solve this problem, then that would be a super valuable thing to do. And maybe ideally partnering up with these people and then going 50-50, they provide the business, you provide the tech. I've had such a deals before, it worked out well, specifically in the Safari industry. I have no idea anything about Safari, but I rely on my partner to tell me what kind of business direction we need to go with. And then I build the tech with his kind of direction. So it works and you can find these people in communities. I found my partner in one of the AI communities. That could be a potential way to go. Let's say you're going the natural way, you're just scraping data. You can use one of these tools like Apollo.io or something that they have access to a lot of email addresses and maybe LinkedIn accounts of a lot of different profiles. You need to define your ideal customer profile, let's say a founder or a CTO in a company who might appreciate your AI automation. If we're talking about maybe a little bit bigger companies or maybe somebody who is like the head of marketing and you want to sell your content automation solutions. So you can gather all these and just have a look like how many do I actually have? Do I have already a database of 100,000, 500,000? Start maybe locally with your country and then expand to more. This gives you maybe a little bit more indication of the opportunity. Uh, one of the main mistakes that I did was the number of potential clients were just so low. In Germany, it was around 2,000, 3,000 wedding venues. I thought if 5% answers, then I have a business and I have a returning revenue or whatever. But uh, usually the, the answering and closing is even way less. Like it's not way less than 5%, especially if you're just blasting a cold outreach email. Even if you're doing personal outreach, it's still super low that you need to have such like a higher number of leads. So that's the first thing that I would focus on, find a way to target and distribute your product before you even start building or before you even learn anything. Because let's say if you're not from a technical background, you can partner up with somebody who is. So that's not a limitation. You just need to find the right opportunities. The second thing that you need before you actually start selling these solutions, let's say you have some, you manage to get some people interested, you start to showing some demos and one of them decide to continue with you. So what you need to do right now is to send them a contract. 
And this is something that I also learned by practicing is you need to draft, like here is a template that I use, something that you specify what kind of services you're going to be doing for them. You need to put your name, your address as a provider, your client's address. This is usually after you defined exactly what is going to go into the service. Some of them, for example, you need to put the uh, compensations, but yeah, you need to draft yourself a contract. For example, I like to sometimes do the transfer of ownership. Some clients, maybe they don't agree with the full wording of what you write here, but ideally something that limits your liability. You agree if something and disputes happen in which res res restriction this is going to happen. For example, for me, this would be in Germany. How much is the deposit? How much are they going to pay? So for example, I pay 50. If they have to pay 50% before we even start. And yeah, like many other things is like what kind of agreements you want. And then finally, something like here where you attach like the scope of work, where you define clearly, these are the deliverables. This is what we, I'm going to deliver for you. And once these deliverables are done, then we consider this agreement finished. You can also add uh, some clauses for the retainer and all this kind of stuff that people talk about. So that's all possible. And the fun part, what I did like a AI automation that from my emails with my clients, try to fill these automatically. So you see here, everything looks like a variable. Uh, so you can fill this automatically by the conversations, sometimes also by the, uh, you know, these bots that you add to your meeting, they transcribe the call, and then you can have an agent that fills these variables automatically for you from the call. Super useful because usually this work has been done unpaid. And the more you minimize this, the more your hourly rate kind of increases. So you just do a little bit less with more. Uh, which is great. Uh, this is the second thing that you definitely need. So you basically send them this. Uh, sometimes I said like some clients disagree with some of the wordings. They want them to be the only owner of the product. And, but they give me like lifelong, they give you access to use, they redistribute the software, uh, reuse some of the components, which is important. Basically, I also add a claw. Uh, let me show you actually here, rights of reuse and educational use, because I would love to display some of the things that I build for my clients on my YouTube channel. I like to tell them like, hey, I want to use this thing. I would remove all the information about the client. So they, people don't know this is, was built for uh, this kind of business, but something like that is super important uh, for me as a maybe as a part of a content uh, creator to be able to reuse what I did for my clients on my own YouTube channel. All right. And now for the third thing that I think is very important for you to really watch out for is the choice of tools. So I know online, there's so many AI tools nowadays. There's make.com and it, and there's so many different tools out there. And I know it becomes really challenging to choose the right tools of what you want to build for your client. In my experience, I've chose N8N so far because it is Berlin based. So the headquarters is in Berlin. The data servers are in Frankfurt. So anything regarding data regulations is automatically secured with N8N, especially for selling to European clients. But of course, within N8N, you're connecting with different APIs and you need to make sure that these APIs are GDPR compliant. They follow some security best practices. You can see them as certificates. For example, Text Cortex is this AI tool for knowledge search. You can also use it as a LLM. They just got certified for many different things, GDPR, um, many other certificates as well. So that gives you a little bit more trust about the provider and about their services. For example, recently a client wanted me to build uh, voice agents for them. And I was looking for the right tool to build. And so far I haven't found, there are some that are compliant, but they are also a little bit pricey. VAPI, for example, we cannot use because they do not guarantee that the data is staying in Europe. Technically, it's not illegal to send your data outside of Europe to the US, but there have been a lot of incidents in the past years where European regulators started to think that the data privacy of the European users are not being done properly in the US. This is not a US problem. The US have like some surveillance uh, laws that was affecting these kind of privacy uh, laws in Europe. So that's why I think there was some sort of agreements in the US and Europe and it caused us some problems. So if you're selling to Europe, always try to limit your tools to European servers. For example, if you're using OpenAI, you can use Azure deployment for the data to be processed and to be present in Europe. So you can do this by hosting your own Azure deployment and putting OpenAI on it. Uh, super easy. So it's not really hosting your servers. It's just using their service and choosing the option for the data to stay in Europe. 
with that, you're basically 100% compliant. You're not hosting your own infrastructure. You're not dealing with all this headache, but it opens other headaches. For example, especially if your clients are not tech savvy, you're going you're gonna to meet two kinds of people. One that is super excited, super involved, and they are tech savvy. These are the best clients that I love to work with. I just tell them like, hey, I would need now, I need you to add your credentials for Google Drive, for example. I send them a YouTube tutorial and they go and do it and send me the credentials, share it with me. I'm like, amazing, wonderful, love it. And I can just do my thing, which is designing the system and building the workflow for them. And they can just do things behind the scene. What usually happens, uh, what I would recommend, for example, if you're building with N8N, they create a project in N8N and then add all the credentials to this project. And they can also add you in this project as a member. They don't send you the login of their own N8N account. That's not what happens. They just add you as a member. Please guys, like don't get your N8N credentials of your clients. That's not safe, especially if you lose it somehow or you get hacked. This is very bad thing. But if they add your account as a member, which is possible in N8N when they're in the cloud version, then you can just be added as a contributor to this project do your thing. You can also access the credentials, build the system for them and leave. And then they have full control over the data. They are the sole data controllers. And you're not even considered a data processor because you're not processing, you're just implementing the thing for them. So again, this is disclaimer. This is what I believe. What This is what I have done in the past. But if there's some loopholes in the things that I'm saying, please don't take it as like the absolute almost truth. Do your own research, but just be a little bit more aware about these kind of topics. The other part... Uh, of clients that you're going to face are clients who have never touched the tech in their life. Even if you tell them, okay, create an N8N account, they find it super challenging. They want you to do it for them. And here where you start to hit a uh, bottleneck. Technically, with the license deal of N8N, you're not allowed to, let's say you host N8N on your own servers, and then you start to offer N8N as a service. This is not technically allowed. What's allowed, you can maybe use N8N as an infrastructure. Let's say you don't want to build a Python API or some custom-made API, and you just want to use N8N as your API and process the things. And then what you're selling is the SaaS product, like uh, maybe something that people put in and then they get something out. But if what you're selling is actually an N8N, so you provide them, like you create your own N8N platform and you just provide them the credentials and you say, hey, I take care over of everything. You just log in here. This is not technically allowed in the licensing deal of N8N. The only option that you're left with is to contact N8N, ask for the corporate, um, you see this always like this uh, thing, like contact us for the corporate license deal. And then they give you a corporate account where you can manage sub accounts for your clients and then do the whole headache that your client doesn't want to do. But then they share with you their Google credentials, their emails. It's so much sensitive data. And if something goes wrong, you're going to be in so much trouble. Uh, so I would recommend give the power and the responsibility to the client and do what you do best. You come in, you build the thing and you leave. Whether you connect them with a retainer, retainers are basically just asking you to reserve some capacity in case something fails that you can just jump in, do your thing for like maybe half an hour and jump out. This is what I've been having right now with some clients where I didn't put them on a retainer. I thought the project ended and they sent me a message like, hey, sorry, um, we have like some things that uh, we changed and then it failed. Can you please just jump in, have a look? And of course, have a look. What does that mean? Have a look like you're going to work for maybe half an hour, which is fine. But then this hour, you're not going to get paid for. Uh, you just did the thing and you just left and it just adds some complexity. You can't also maybe, maybe you can build them for an hour, but it's not worth creating like an invoice, doing all this kind of work for the sake of one hour. So that's where people tell you, yeah, like we can do like a retainer where if anything happened, I can jump in and help you. So make sure if you're Europe, all the tools have their servers in Europe. You can see that in their terms of service, in their uh, website. Be very critical. Some people say, oh, we are GDPR compliant. Maybe they're not. So try to read the uh, proof and certificate as well. The final thing that you need once you are selling to businesses in general and you are doing AI automations is an invoice. I know this <laughs> This might sound silly to most of you, but I remember the first time I wrote my first invoice, it was like a strange thing to do. So there are certain regulations that needs to go through that. Again, I have to unfortunately talk about German specific invoicing systems, but I guess this also applies to maybe other countries. Uh, so when you're writing an invoice, there are certain requirements for this to be like legally binding document. You need to add for example, if you're using certain clause in your invoice, you need to mention that. If you're not charging for VAT, you need to mention why. 
this is not a legally binding thing, but it's a best practice. But what's legally binding is like the increments, like invoice number one, two, or three. There shouldn't be any loophole in between, like not just like invoice number one, two, and then five. If you're building invoices manually, especially in the beginning, then you need to make sure that you don't mess this up. Uh, ideally, just use like some soft software to build the invoices automatically for you, and that will be fine. But then, yeah, like make sure you also, which I was surprised that some people don't know, like make sure to have your own business account. Uh, that is separate from your private, even if the business is under your name, uh, just to separate the concerns, make sure everything that is business expense related is in the business account. But this is just a common like best practices in businesses, not really specifically for AI, but I was surprised that a lot of people also didn't know that. And they were like, oh, I didn't know I have to do that. I've been spending from my private, which technically is okay if uh, you have your private account and you're spending from it. But yeah, try to separate these things, makes it less headache for the tax people and filing your taxes and just makes everything cleaner. So start the proper way and then it will make sure things uh, are just easier to do. Okay, and actually one last thing, after you deploy your AI workflows, the job is not done. As you know, most of these AI solutions, they tend to maybe change with time. As you saw now, a couple of days ago, the whole OpenAI API was down. So that caused a lot of problems. So when you're developing these solutions, you need to think of, okay, now I deployed it for you. The client paid you, you're happy. The agreement and the arrangement doesn't stop there. If you build a solution for someone, the work doesn't stop the moment you uh, just give up the solution. There are maintenance, there are updates, especially if the client is not tech savvy. Every once in a while, maybe you need to update the NA10 servers and there is going to be a downtime when you do that in their paid version. So make sure to be upfront to the client. It's like we're going to do maintenance maybe once a month where we update the uh, versions to the newest version. And in that period, uh, there's going to be a downtime of service. Maybe try to do it on a time where the traffic is really low so it doesn't hurt. And also make sure to maybe don't bind everything to one API provider like OpenAI, but maybe try to build fallback mechanism. Like if OpenAI is down, then maybe send a call to Gemini or send a call to another LLM provider. Make sure to also log data whenever you need, uh, just to make sure that the AI is doing what it's doing. And you can do like, what I like to do is like a monthly uh, review where I get the feedback I usually get, uh, I usually log the inputs and outputs. So what is the input for the AI? What was the output? And whether this thing solved the problem. So I also put the human to tell me like, hey, this solved the problem, this doesn't solve the problem. And then you need to evaluate whether it's manually or through some metrics. You can measure the metrics, like how much success rate did you have? Did it always solve the problem? Uh, usually solve the problem means approval. Like say you're doing content generation and then the human can approve or like say like approved or not approved. You can measure this, like how many times did the human say like, no, I don't approve this content. And then you need to see why did it get rejected? How can you fine tune it? How can you maybe split it into different LLMs and don't give the one agent to do everything? So these are the things that are iterative. I uploaded my chatbot to my website. And now, for example, after I got a lot of traffic, people have been <laughs> playing around with it. Yeah, feel free to play around. I'm happy that people are getting excited. It, it is doing what it's doing. It's a lead magnet that you give the people some value to interact and I give them some pricing. Everybody wants to know the price before they talk to me. So everybody was talking about the prices. I noticed that the AI was just giving really high prices. Not really high, but like maybe a little bit higher. Although I told it to like give them something that is not so high so we can have a chat. It was just funny to see that people are like fighting with the AI and saying, oh, don't you think this is too expensive for an AI agent? And then the AI say like, no, this is not too expensive because we're going to be doing this and this and that. And I was smiling. I was like, yeah, you go, girl, go show them. <laughs> go show them. Um, but yeah, it made me lose some leads. So it's not great, obviously. So I had to refine it and see the inputs and outputs, maybe retrain it or add some extra knowledge to its database to say like, hey, for this kind of projects, a reasonable price would be from here to here. And this is what uh, we're aiming at. So don't over charge and yeah this is iterative i did lose some clients because of this uh i wouldn't say mistake i was kind of okay with the price and maybe we can reach that level at some point but um yeah these are the things just like what is the expectation and you need to try to iterate on that i hope that video helped i hope you have now a little bit more picture of what actually happens behind the scenes what kind of clients you're going to face uh, what kind of 
processes you're going to have to encounter and how to at least be a little bit more prepared realistically on what is going to come your way rather than somebody telling you you're going to build this with 30 minutes and then be rich in a month. It's not like that at all, but there is an opportunity for you to be an expert, to help other businesses build really awesome things. This is what I believe, but things, of course, take a lot of time and a lot of patience. And AI also takes a lot of patience, definitely, because sometimes it's so unpredictable that it kind of annoys you that why aren't you working? I hope this video helped you. Make sure to subscribe and like this video and maybe tell me in the comments what you believe and how was your experience so far building and selling AI solutions. I would love to talk to you in the comments.